peptides are loaded onto MHC and they're being seen. Now, an important feature of this process is that there is a lot of information in a peptide MHC complex. And the information is both in the MHC and in the peptide. That will be important. So the binding groups are encoded in the genome, as you know, of course, because they, uh, they determine the sequence of the, of the MHC protein that's being made from our genetic information. The anchor residues, which fit into the binding pockets, now in simplified version, to these genetically encoded pockets, they, are, they can come from anywhere. They can be self-peptides or they can be foreign antigens. But the, the, the binding they achieve is determined by the genome. Now, I can take this one further and I can say, okay, if my carrier, which is the MHC in this case, that carries the ligand, which is peptide in our case, to the cell surface, and it's recognized by the T cell receptor as a sensory modality, we can now consider the peptide as a surrogate measure of genomic information. Admittedly, it recognizes or it determines only a small aspect of our genetic diversity, but a very important one because these MHC molecules are very polymorphic and likely to be different in each individual in the room here. Whereas other polymorphisms in the genome are less frequent. So if one were able to read the structure of the peptide, like Hans Georg Gramensee did in the, whenever that was in the 80s, he could determine backwards what the structure of these binding groups were. So reading the peptide would allow you to make guesses, not perfect ones, but reasonable guesses about the structure of your MHC molecule and about the underlying genetic individuality. Now, what about if these antigen-presenting molecules had a different function before they were deployed in the immune system? I think when you look about this and when you look at this hypothesis that I put up here, when these antigen presenting molecules are very polymorphic, you have a good chance of detecting a pathogen because any odd peptide that will bind and then you might be able to initiate an immune response. So you want to avoid inbreeding. Because if you are genetically identical, it would be nice and easy for a pathogen to evade immune response because it looks at a genetically uniform population. So it makes sense to have this as a very polymorphic type or class of genes. If that is true, and if we cannot avoid inbreeding, that is particularly relevant, of course, for populations of a low effective uh, population size. So you have, I don't know how many, how many people you have in Paris, maybe 2 million or maybe even more, let's say 10 million. But you don't have a chance to interrogate all of them in this prezygotic selection process to see who might be the best fit for, your, uh, for producing offspring. So you, even in these densely populated areas, the effective population size that is uh, available for any one of us for, for um, producing offspring is rel rel relatively small. So the, it would be nice then to connect this quality control system that's being used for the antigen receptors that is in, in, important for making sure that we have a robust immune response, if that were also used for Prezygotic selection. So this is basically coming back to my table that I showed in the beginning. So now we had this postzygotic immune surveillance. Now the quality control that was used to make sure that the receptors are not self-reactive is now being used to make sure that we don't that we don't mate with the wrong person or with the wrong individual. We don't want to homogenize our genetic pool. So again, our information content. The the the, the Peptides are the mirror images of the genome. Now, we had intercellular discrimination, one cell from the next, because, for example, one cell is infected with the virus, then the repertoire of peptides at the surface are different. T cell receptors can recognize this, distinguish one self cell, cell one from a non infected from an infected cell, and destroy this perhaps. Now we can translate this system into inter individual discrimination. Now it has to be slightly differently organized. Now, the key thing is we need to bring the ligand 
in contact with the extracellular environment. And for the immune system, it makes sense, of course, to avoid collateral damage that the cell that is infected keeps this foreign antigen. If it would spread easily, then of course it would be a bit of a problem because it would kill cells that are not really infected. So, but for an inter-individual discrimination, you have to venture outside of the individual, so it has to somehow enter the extracellular space. And it is then, because we're no longer talking about the immune system, and now we're talking about prezygotic mate selection, it has to be employed somehow by the nervous system. And the, the key insight that made me think about this was work that was done while I was in Cambridge by a chap at the university. I was at the laboratory of molecular biology, who found fragments of MHC molecules in the urine, I think it was rats. And there was another person by the name of uh, Barry Cavern, who was very interested in the olfactory system. So bringing these two things together and them teaching me how to dissect olfactory epithelium and study it, I thought one could do a very simple experiment. Perhaps when these peptides are shed from the cell surface by some peptidase or proteinase or whatever, being liberated from the binding groove, become available in bodily fluids like urine, saliva, and, uh, and, and uh, tears or whatever, they could potentially be assayed by another sensory modality. And that sensory modality, of course, was the olfactory system. And I quickly learned that the, m that the most likely site where to look was the accessory olfactory system, which was known from studies by many people, that this would confer information about pheromones, that is, helping making mice, in this particular case, make decisions about mate choice. And it was a very simple experiment then to test whether peptides would activate, based on their sequence and based on their anchor residues, which are a reflection of the genetic com uh, composition, if you remember, in my scheme, would differentially activate sensory neurons in this particular part of the olfactory system. And that was the case. It was a very surprising finding, and I still, I'm still amazed how well that experiment worked and how sensitive the system is. It, if you calculate it properly, it can recognize down to one or a handful of peptides and elicit a response, and also a behavioral response, as I will show you in a moment. So you can see this here color-coded. We activated this, these neurons with different peptides, free peptides, not MHC peptide complexes, free peptides, chemically synthesized peptides of defined structure, and they created this combinatorial activation. And mice can <coughs> exploit that information and make behavioral decisions. Nicely summarized here by uh, colleagues of mine, where, they, where we showed, they just interpret this nicely in this picture, how peptides can function as individuality signals in a process that is called pregnancy block, where a female recognizes the genetic identity of the father of her offspring. And if you swap the genetic identity, or if you swap the father, early in, in pregnancy, the mouse would abort because the new male will soon start to impregnate her, and it makes no sense to have mice born that will be killed by infanticide by the foreign father. And what is, what is more, when you go and look which type of residues of these peptides the olfactory system recognizes, or these sensory neurons rather recognize, and we have an idea now about the receptors to do this, nothing to do with MHC or something, there is co-evolution. So we know, for example, that if you can look at this, MHC class 1 peptides have their binding pockets normally at position 2 and 9, it's all approximation, of course, and you can see that the nasal sensory neurons, abbreviated here as BSN, also recognize preferentially first, uh, the second, the third, and the ninth the residue of peptides when we change the, the, the identity of the side chains. Um, so it means that there is co-evolution of the system, which means that these two things have come together. We, of course, we do not know the order of events. Everybody except me thinks this came later. So once MHC was invented, it was then employed for sexual selection. I would, for one, for one, 
would maintain it was the other way around. MHC peptide presentation was invented to prevent inbreeding. It's a very complicated cell biological process and I just can't see how one could quickly evolve this when somatic diversification was invented. So I think it existed before and it was then rapidly deployed in the immune system. And just reiterating that point I was just making about uh, the, the number of people living in Paris, finding the right mate is really very important when you don't have access to many individuals. You really want to be careful about this and you want to avoid mating within the family. And we have a project which also seems a bit bizarre, you will see in a moment, which I think helps us answer some important questions. And that is a project that I'm doing together with Theodore Peach, an ichthyologist at the University of, um, of Oregon. Um, and he studies anglerfish. This is a male anglerfish. And I'll point out two things, and then I'll, you will see why. Oh, no, one thing actually I want to point out where the arrow is. This fish has very big eyes because it lives in the deep sea about three kilometers below the surface. Not much like that. Except for bioluminescent bacteria that are being carried by the female of these particular species. But you also can see the olfactory apparatus. It's basically a swimming testicle. There is not much else but testicle and an, an enormous sensory apparatus. And one never, people have never observed this, but the assumption is that the male uses this sensory input to find a female. You can see the female slightly bigger than the male. The male is at bottom. And this is okay. So the female just goes and finds the, the female, attaches to it, and you might say, okay, well then the two happily live together until whenever. But the, for the immunologists, the key thing here is the following. They establish a, a common blood circulation. So it's parabiosis as a natural means of reproduction. There are so few cells in this, uh, so, so few animals in this deep sea that they have a very difficult time to find a mate. And once they found a mate, they attach. Now, you wonder why is that possible? If I were to do parabiosis with any randomly picked animal, it probably wouldn't work because there is some major problem with uh, 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 history incompatibility. In this case, it does work. There are some females known, which I haven't got hold of yet, because they are, of course, very cherished museum specimens, where a female has up to 12 males attached to it. Now, we can make predictions. What is the MHC structure of male and female like? Well, the easy answer is they're isogenic. So they, there is no difference. This is why there is no tissue rejection. Now, as an ecologist, you would say, no, that doesn't make any sense at all because that would homogenize the gene pool. And that's not a good idea from the point of view of immune defense. So, we know already from preliminary experiments that the MHC genes, based on sequence, of course, we, we can't do any functional experiments because they're basically dead when they come to the surface, but the MHC genes are different. They are relatively different, and we can make some sort of guesses, wild guesses, why that they are different enough to recognize or bind to different types of peptides. So this cannot be the solution, why this tissue rejection does not occur. So they must have found a way of somehow modulating the immune response, perhaps akin or parallel to what we have to do when we as placental animals have to deal with pregnancy and, and, and other graft inside our bodies. So I think that what we have here, we have an evolution of an intercellular form of inter-individual discrimination. And we initially probably produced this, as I say, I'm the only one believing this. This was a system of interrogating genetic individuality indirectly 
by producing a polymorphic carrier molecule that would then selectively read out here the green or the, or the yellow peptide and transport that into the extracellular space. And I could make a guess, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be less or, uh, out of the equilibrium, 50-50, and then you will do well. And then the only thing you had to do was to anchor this um, peptide carrier to the cell surface. And then you could use it for intercellular discrimination, not only me, this is a relatively small step. And then to maintain the ancient function, you had to generate a ectodomain shedding process, which is of course widespread and used in many, many different systems, to make again available these peptides for this inter-individual discrimination. <coughs> so we have a dual role of these MHC ligands. They are being read as peptide MHC complexes by the T-cell receptor as a sensory module. When once liberated, they are being seen by another type of receptor in the uh, nervous system to regulate behavior. And I think what is the lesson from this is, and I think that is something that one has to remember when one thinks about the immune system or evolution in general, whenever you invent something, you are creating new constraints for co-evolution. You cannot just go forward in one area without having to pay the price in another. So in this scheme here that I've taken from a review of, uh, about our work, um, there is a mechanistic connection now between evolution of behavioral mechanisms and immune surveillance or immune function. And in the way I portrayed it to you, for me at least, it makes perfect sense that there was at one point a coalescence of these two different arms of or these different types of requirements and now we at least have one possible mechanistic basis for this process how we can link immunity and behavior. I'm at the end and now comes the most important slide. This is over the time I've collaborated with many fantastic colleagues always uh, willing to listen to my Questions. The Zufals helped me with electrophysiology. Peter Brennan with pregnancy block, for example. Brer also is a physiologist. And with Mombats, I collaborated on identifying the receptor for these peptides in the mongrel nasal system. Theodore Peach, I mentioned at the end, is the man who guided me through the deep waters of uh, anglerfish. With Max Cooper, we collaborate on the lamprey immune system in various ways. Nick Holland introduced us to cephalochordates. And with uh, uh, Wenki from Singapore, I'm collaborating, or we're collaborating, on lower benefits and trying to understand similarities and dissimilarities in the immune system. And I would also like to thank my people that I work with. This is the current photo, and I mentioned work by Jeremy Swan. You've seen the name on one of the slides, Isabel. Uh, work on this, and Michel Schaub is my long-term collaborator in charge of running our fish facility uh, and doing all the genetic screens we do with, uh, with zebrafish, for example. And the names in black are the ones that worked on the MHC uh, uh, project and have since left the lab. And you gave me 52 minutes and 16 seconds. I'm just right on time. Thank you very much. Questions? Are there any questions for Thomas? Systems exist 
could, would function like MHC would in selection in the absence of adaptive immunity. No, that's basically the question. It has two parts. We are trying to find the MHC equivalent in lamprey because that would be a pre-requirement for our idea. And this is why people don't believe me unless I show them that lamprey also has an MHC type or functionally equivalent system. Um, we are relatively close, but not yet there. Um, my guess is that it probably is true that lamprey also has something that is a polymorphic uh, antigen presenting system. That's okay, but that's a vertebrate. So in my, in my view of things, no surprise. We haven't been able to find anything that would equate this in a living non-vertebrate. Now, I have a very easy excuse. All the middle bit here, including the common vertebrate ancestor, is no longer with us on Earth. And it's exactly there where this was evolving first. I'm afraid I have no answer. I'll probably have to live with this for the rest of my life. I'm so afraid. Actually, I had the same question that you had, but I have another one. Is there any other system or not system, but modality, where, apart from the immune system and nervous system, where there is required self and self discrimination? Or is something that you think is only in these two systems? Well, it depends how you define self, non-self discrimination. If you are looking for ways of differentiating at a cell surface, of course there are many different types of systems. So you can think of coherence and these kind of things. So you can really make uh, cells, because you have to form tissues, you have to somehow segregate individual cell types. That is also some form of self if you wish, at the level non, of individual. Non, yeah, so that's all at the level of individual, but this is all dealing with non polymorphic structures. So I think that's probably the key thing. So that the self non self discrimination has to be in abstract form be divided into systems where there is no polymorphism, somatically generated, and those where that is the case. So then I think this is a different type of problem. Is there similarity between MHC and olfactory receptors in the binding of peptides? Well, functionally, yes. I showed you this, this the specificity for particular uh, residues along the peptide sequence, but structurally, no. So we we have well, we failed so far to find the exquisitely specific peptide receptors, but we know of a receptor of the classical G protein type with a long end terminal domain that is must be part of the general peptide recognition complex because when we knock out this one, the peptide responses are gone. But this, of course, cannot explain the specificity. We do know, though, that these particular neurons express more than one receptor uh, on the surface, so we think the peptide specificity comes about by combinatorial expression of these receptors. It's a probably heteromeric complex. The experimental problem here is, was and still is, that it's incredibly difficult to express these receptors. Cells don't like them. And we just, we, we think there are accessory molecules that somehow make these receptors tolerable to cells. And we just haven't been able to reconstitute these receptor complexes ectopically on heterologous cell systems. That makes it incredibly difficult to find the receptors. We have some candidates based on single cell uh, analysis, so where we take out from the epithelium peptide reactive cells in this peptide fashion, so against peptide A, take them and compare the sequence, or RNA sequence. And, and another one and compare and then we look for what is common and then so we have our candidates but we just can't do the killer experiment that's a bit of a problem but my guess is it's not nothing to do with MHC because we know that MHC knockouts have no problem in recognizing peptides as well thank you very much in my, in my understanding in lampreys the T cell receptors are less enriched repeat based and not immunoglobulin uh, do they also recognize peptide-based uh, complexes? 
or is there other form of non-self and self-discrimination? Very good question. We have no we have no receptor, or no, we have no ligand for any specific receptor. So officially, we do not know. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. Then thanks to everyone for attending. Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, I was trying to ask a second one. Uh, so the, it is found also in. Uh, Fluids CD4 and CD8 that has been shed. Do you think in, they in have some in, what, in? in in uh, in physiological fluids like uh, urine or uh, sweat? Uh, there is also CD4 and CD8 that is found there that is shed from the surface. Do you think that has something to do with uh, the peptides or what? MHC also being shed uh, with the peptides? Well, the M, well, we call shedding when we find the extracellular domain in soluble form. Whether or not all of these fragments are generated by specific, let's say, some or the other metalloprotease, I'm not sure that we can say this. It's never been examined. The fact that these molecules always look the same, so they, they, the breakpoint, as it were, is always at the same site. Either means there is a protease that recognizes this and cuts it, or it's just a structural consequence that they are very susceptible to protease attack. So, um, well, I would tend to think it's probably not connected, but I mean, it's difficult to say. short question about the, the evolution of the immune system. I just want to know when, according to your definition, the immune systems appeared. Because if uh, you say that the immune system was built after some forms of self, non-self discrimination, and if you consider that prokaryotes, for example, have an immune system, I guess you will, will have a different view on when immune systems appeared and on which basis they were built. So just a very general question about when they started to appear. Well, if you define immunity as genetic defense, as it were, then I think it probably started very early, and all, even the, the prokaryotes, have various forms of defending themselves, restriction modification systems. We have the CRISPR-Cas that everybody knows about now these days. Um, um, the, the, I think one important distinction is anticipation. So there are some systems that prepare themselves for the future and basically are wasteful in a sense. Hopefully most of my T cell receptors expressed on T cells will never see something. Um, but just in case, I'm making them. So there is an anticipation or anticip anticipatory element in our immune system, which bacteria would not do. They basically respond, they are adaptive because, for example, they, when they take some phage fra DNA fragment and put it in the genome, and then next time they can defend themselves. So that is adaptive, clearly. So uh, calling, it a, calling our immune system adaptive, I think, is not actually making the point. The point more is in terms of the, 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 the recognition mode, anticipation. So I generate, just in case, a diverse repertoire. And this is, I think, something that distinguishes our system from others. But many invertebrates do not do that. Many do invertebrates not do, do not do anticipate, do not do the kind of... Uh, yes. <coughs> yeah, the, the mystery is, I mean, you're pointing to, into the, this is our sort of sore point. The mystery is, why was it that all vertebrates apparently do this? So there must have been some selective pressure, again, in this dark age of, I don't know where that was, cause these, cell, these organisms to survive only with such an anticipatory, uh, with, yeah, with anticipatory uh, immune system. And the interesting thing there is, I think this is why it's so important to study the lamprey, why this was such a landmark discovery. Not because they have a different type of receptor, but that they actually have one that is molecularly different. So they, it's not coming from the same origin. So it, there must be, at this particular point in evolution, there must have been enormous pressure to generate, at all costs, a system that would generate these anticipatory molecules. I have no idea what that was. <laughs>
uh, you've talked about uh, mostly negative selection. You've talked about mostly about negative selection in the framework of self-financial discrimination. But what about the passive selection and why there is a need for, for, for constraining uh, the selection to uh, uh, with the positive selection? So, what is the explanation for, what is the need for positive selection? I don't grapple with that. Yes, I skipped over uh, positive selection. You can think of positive selection as another cell intrinsic quality control, which is not cell non-autonomous in certain ways. Because it basically checks, first of all, that the receptor is actually made. Because without signaling or even tonic signaling from the receptor, there is no survival. So if you couple the, the production of a functional receptor to survival, then you are fine. And you don't want cells that don't have a receptor. That, I think, is relatively easy. And the question is, is this tonic signal coming from the T-cell receptor in that case, recognizing an MHC peptide complex, or is it the mere expression of the receptor, the cell surface, that does the trick? If it was the latter, it's cell monotonous. Or you could say, judging from the experiments where one restricted the repertoire of peptides on MHC molecules, that any odd MHC peptide complex will do. Because what this positive selection will do, it will simply check whether the receptor can see MHC molecules and, and your MHC molecules. And the peptide sequence as such doesn't really <coughs> matter so much. So it's fundamentally different from, a, let's say, an immunological role of that receptor. It's more a cell biological developmental role, I would say. So it's just had this similar terminology, but I think when you think about it in terms of the function, it's something completely different. It's just preparing the cells for the real McCoy, basically. Okay. So thanks again for to everyone for coming, and many thanks to Thomas for coming from Freiburg to to give us this wonderful talk. We have a little present for Thomas uh, from the museum. I promise next time I will have a pointer. For I will buy one. I have it always in my pocket. And uh, so there will be another seminar, uh, Stapas uh, seminar uh, before the end of the, the year. And well, anything else? Thanks to the people that have organized this, Claire, Christiane, and also Laura, who is not here. And see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>